This is Off Planet Radio. Welcome back to section two, part two, of my interview with Patty Greer. This is Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins, and uh, in this in this segment, we're going to go into what I hope is going to be the heart of this conversation that I'm having with my guest, Patty Greer. Um, we're going to get into the crop circles and the technology, and the work that she's done really in bringing forward things that are positive, things we need in this world. We need to be able to advance our civilization organically. We need to start working from the heart. We need to get away from all of this dark energy around us and the dark energy that we use to power our world. We need to grow crops and we need to become holistic and organic again. And the crop circles hold the secret for a lot of this technology. And with that, I welcome back Patty Greer. Welcome back. Thank you, and perfect introduction because there really is so much magic in the crop circles. And even how I met Penny Kelly, you know, that night, I didn't know who she was for four hours. And it wasn't until I left that that little key was placed in my hand. And when she looked at the man and said, you didn't tell her who I was? He said, no. And then when she told me, I was stumped because it was like, I've been here four hours and we could have been doing this. So I gave her one of my movies. And then I looked at the cover of her book. It was by Penny Kelly and William Levengood. So the man drives me back to the hotel and I'm thinking, why didn't you tell me who that was? And he said, well, you know, I've graduated all of her intuition courses. It's, I just figured you'd know. And I'm like, well, I haven't been to school yet, honey. So no, wow, that was amazing. And I really need to go back and see her again. So she said, come back in a month to the wake of Lefty and um, you know, do it with us. So I was so excited, you know, no big deal. I'll just drive from Michigan to Colorado a few times, but small price, are you kidding? I'd love to. So the man takes me back to the hotel. It's two in the morning, maybe 2.30. And he dropped me at the front like a gentleman and I'm walking up to the door. And, Two of the psychics at the gig are standing there watching me nodding, smiling. And I was like, hi, ladies. It's 2.30 in the morning. And the one said, quite the handsome gentleman next to you. And I'm looking like I thought the guy got out of the car. Nobody there. And so I said, excuse me. And she said, the tall gentleman, silver hair, silver goatee, thin. He's got a message. Can I give it to you? And I said, uh, okay. She said, he wants you to know that he orchestrated this and he's really glad it worked. Now I'm standing there, it's 2.30 in the morning, and I said, oh, hold on, I'll be right back. And I ran through the parking lot, I'm jumping up and down, trying to get this guy's attention. And he looked in the rear view and he backed up and I'm panting and I said, what did Levin Good look like? Because I'd never even studied him, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't do research. I went and laid in crop circles. I didn't do research. So I don't know anybody's work at that time. Uh, so uh, Stan says to me, tall, silver hair, silver goatee, why? And I said, he's here. He, he brought us together and he, and he orchestrated this and he's glad it worked. And Stan just keeps a totally straight face. And I said, I'm freaking here. Why do you have a straight face? And he starts to slowly pull away and he said, I did Penny's intuition courses and off he goes and I'm standing there like, ah, the dead guy is playing me now. So the coolest thing was that when I came back a month later, 
I had planned to be there for three days. I stayed three weeks. Penny and I were nonstop trading information because she's never been in a crop circle, but she's done hundreds and hundreds of crop circle node exploration scientifically with the magnetics and all the um, different fields of energy. She's also, she and Lefty had chunks of the Roswell craft at their lab. No. Pieces of the Roswell, yeah. So Penny's no small deal. She's just extremely humble and incredibly bright. So here I am now at her house every day and she's teaching me the science five days in a row, coffee in the morning, I'm holding my head like this, literally pushing. And she says, why are you doing this? You look so silly, day three, day four, day five. And I said, I'm actually serious, you're blowing my mind and it hurts. Tell me again, how are crop circles happening? And I'd squeeze, I mean, it like hurt. Because here I am, I've been in at least 100 by then, and I'm thinking, you know, oh, Buzz, you know, it's, and it wasn't that at all. What she and Lefty discovered, which I, I, mastered their story in Crop Circle Diaries. This is perhaps my final film, Crop Circle Diaries, and it just won uh, Best Feature Film in the People's Choice at the International UFO Congress. Probably my last film because it's not fun. But also, what else is there to say? We answered the science. So with all these different samples coming from the lab, they measured how much uh, magnetics was in the center, five feet out, five feet out, and they kept measuring different samples, and they ultimately found, but it was through a complete interesting accident, the actual punchline. And here's how they found it. They've got all these nodes, and a node is where the wheat bends. If you go in a crop circle, you get you're on your knees and you can look. If humans made the crop circle, then every three feet, you'll see where they put the board down, stepped on it, and you'll see a line of broken wheat. If you go into a crop circle not made by humans and you look where they bend, you will see a bubble, a blown node that is a biophysical change that happened to the stalk of food, of crop. Uh, barley, wheat, corn. Corn is huge. I mean, to bend a corn plant, canola, early season in England, yellow flowers, but they're like an inch and so brittle. You can't possibly bend one without it breaking, but we've got acres of curved and arched corn and canola. It, it's mastery, and they, humans can't do that. Humans can break it every three feet with a board and ropes, and of course, there's something for the BBC and ancient aliens to go film, you know? Um, on the other hand, there's a lot of crop circles where I walked in, the very first one that you asked me about, we forgot to go there, and the hair stood up on my arms. Now, I got teeny hairs, but it was like and tingles on my head. It felt like the hair was standing up on my head. Very first crop circle, I had no idea what to expect. And we're like 10, 20 feet before we even saw the wheat laid and swirled down. But all of a sudden I could feel this shifted electromagnetic field. And I turned around to my daughter behind me and she's like, yeah, mom, I feel it. Like a teenager rolling her eyes. Yes, I feel it. And behind her was a lady that we had just met who's still a great friend, turned out to be the arch druidess of Stonehenge, Victoria. Mm -hmm. And so here we are, three women walking into a crop circle, my first one ever, totally rainy day. It's cold, the wheat is up to our hips, we're all in jeans, soaking jeans by the time we got to the formation, but we're just walking in a tractor line having no idea what's gonna happen, and all of a sudden, zing, you know, it's like, whoa electromagnetic, electrostatic, and you're just like, whoa, something different. And then when you all of a sudden get to the opening, visibly it is just breathtaking because the walls of the wheat, where it's laid in, it's like swirled down in one movement. So it's like, boom, like a swirl. And then everything standing is just meticulous, really clean, really tight. And, um, so it was just sizzling energy. And right when we walked in and then you can see the lay is so meticulous, it, it takes your breath away. And if you're sensitive at all, you can also physically feel it. I was sold. And you know, the other two ladies with me, we were all just blown away. The walls were perfect, the lay was perfect. And then we got in the second shape and it looked like in the middle, some animal or some person had hacked up the wheat. It was meticulous except this one area looked like it had been chopped up with something. 
So my daughter was getting cold. She asked permission, you know, can I go out the tram line? You can see me, the other ladies at the car with the two big dogs. And um, so I said, sure, you go. And I, I wasn't ready to leave anytime soon. So I watched her walk across the field and the other lady and I turned our backs and you know, it's still raining and we're cold, but we didn't care. We were so lit up. And sure enough, I turned my back and I'm running my pendulum, you know, and I look over and she's running hers. So we meet in the middle and I said, what did you get? And we both got the exact same thing. It's a real crop circle. We didn't know what that meant at the time. And a human carved it up. And now I start to hear some man yelling and I look across the wheat and there's my daughter with some big guy. Uh, and all I could see was a man yelling and there's my kid over there and the Aussie lady with the little car and the big dogs. And I, I'm like, oh God, you know, protect a mama. So I go flying across the field like Superwoman, you know, and I, <laughs> and I get there luckily a minute too late because the farmer is yelling, didn't you see the signs? Nobody's allowed on my property. You are trespassing and I could shoot you on my land. And my daughter so much quicker than myself said, lo siento señor, no entiendo inglés. She started speaking Spanish, and I'm like, oh my God, brilliant. So I, I, I come up panting, and I'm like, hey, problema? And here comes, and she just Barbara turned around and walked away, gruff, he was pissed off. And as he turned around, I saw that the white strap that went across the front of him was a big white satchel on his back, like a big white purse that was holding his hacksaw hack saw that he hacked up his his crop circle like what so people aren't going to come on your land and in that moment i went oh my god i mean it was almost like i got the a to the z in my very first crop circle so the farmers are instructed to hack it whack it wipe it out get rid of it not let people but this year the farmers are instructed to take our license plates and report it to the police if you come on their land to see a crop circle now, how do you know to get to a, a site where there's a crop circle timely enough to be able to enter it before it's disturbed or taken away? I mean, how quickly are Great. you moving? Great question. Uh, somehow, probably because I was the insanely fearless American, who was the only person that when it was windy and rainy and we're at the airport, and there's six of us and everybody wants to fly in the little planes and it's windy and rainy and the pilot goes, nobody's gonna wanna fly. I mean, come on, look at the sky. Does anybody wanna fly? And I'd look around and I'd go, no, 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 I do, I'll go. So I'd always be the one, you know, that I didn't have to stand in line, but I'd come down like, you know, but boy, did I get the footage. So um, yeah, um, you know, you. I guess, you know, when you're over there, you're almost like in a spell. You're in an area that's all Druid people. It's not like pavement and clean cars like where I live in America. It's not people dressed up in fancy silk and driving yeah. BMWs. It's people in funky cars that are dirty. Their homes have lots of spider webs and their gardens are gorgeous and massive. Again, it's a different frequency. Hmm. Not better, not worse, just extremely Druid. And so we've got all these reasons that the crop circles are the epicenter is in this area. But how do we find the crop circles? We had, until last year, a research center. So last year, our research center closed, the silent circle, where I went every morning. And right at the beginning, because I was willing to go up in the planes and fly, they moved me right to the front line, which was the coolest thing because I was there every morning at the research center, first thing with all of the real people that are total crappie addicts from around the world. We'd meet early and there was a map where the pilots would call in and tell the owner of the research center or tell a researcher that they liked or that, you know, gave them money. There's a new formation over there, West Kennet Long Barrow. And, you know, we'd head out really quickly. But as long as we were there first thing in the morning, we would always know before the public did, before the tour groups went, but it did help definitely to know the pilots. And that's how you find out where the new formations are. But the years I was there, 2006 was my taster in the rain with the farmer that um, was trying to get us out of his field. 
and we got away with it. But, you know, it was my first sign of, wow, they don't like people in their field. And um, he was threatening to shoot us. That's nice. Welcome to England. It's not that way, though. The, the epicenter of deliveries of crop circles happens to be Wiltshire, England. Now, right. off to one side is Stone, Stonehenge, and off to the other side is Glastonbury, and right there in the middle is Avebury Stone Circle that nobody yes. hardly knows about. And the Avebury Stone Circle is the epicenter of crop circle appearances, or more specifically, crop circle documentations, because who knows, there could be thousands of them in Montana, but if nobody's flying over or going into the fields, well, it could even be grassland. We know that yeah. well, we had one in a neighboring county here to me in, in southern central, central Pennsylvania a few years ago. By the time I found out about it, it was gone. But the fact of the matter is they're occurring. The occurrences seem to be smaller here. We don't know. I mean, there's nobody here studying crop circles. So we don't know if these are human or energetically made or alien or whatever. But it's interesting that the epicenter of this is in Wiltshire, that it's near Avebury, and it goes into a lot of the mysteries, as you're talking about, about the Druid people, about the Celt culture, the energetics that go into Avebury, Stonehenge, all these, these sites that have all this mystery to them. And then what does that mean in terms of what's going on underneath? in terms of the energies that are emanating out of the earth, because as you've pointed out, we don't have a real evidence that UFOs are creating crop circles, right? I mean, but we do know something about, UFOs. Earth, about the earth energetics. So talk about that a little bit. Talk about what you think's going on under the ground. Okay, well, we actually know quite a lot because of William Levengood, who was highly suppressed, kind of like they've been trying to do to me, but I'm jumping out of the box like a crazy jack-in-the-box because it's too important. And everybody likes food, right? I mean, food's important, so here we go. I do want to mention my website because if you guys want to look at photos of crop circles, my page is called cropcirclefilmswithans.com, cropcirclefilms.com. If you go to any page, the pages are slathered with gorgeous photos of crop circles. You're going to love me more, and you're going to love him more for inviting me on the show, because now you're going to get to go look at crop circles, yeah. and you tap it, and it's like, they're not just a pile of wheat laid down. Some of them are braided and woven. My favorite crop circle center ever is flawlessly laid, and there's a sprig coming up and a living flower, a big flower pink. How does this happen? It's phenomenal. By the so way, Wiltshire, that, Wil website, that website is right underneath the th there in the lower third of the video the whole time. So anybody that wants to see your website, it's going to be right there underneath it. So. But, Good. Well, there's so much to learn. And um, I really, it's not like I want to pride myself, but I'm just saying Lefty well, picked me. Lefty yeah. picked me. And the fact that he came back from the dead and did it in front of psychics and then a month later, I went to Penny's farm, and I saw him walk through the door the first night. That's when I had to pinch myself and think, what the hey? But I saw him, clear as day. Now, granted, I had looked at photos, but when he walked through, I was like, I got this. I know who you are, and I'm not scared. You know what I'm like? I mean, seriously, I saw him. It was, it was, it was definitely him. And Penny just laughed. She goes, oh, he likes to, you know, I mean, she's just like all good with it. So... What a blessing, though, because I am one of the only people probably that would tolerate what I've tolerated and still be standing with an authentic smile and love what I do this much. So crop circles, the epicenter is Wiltshire, the Avery Stone Circle, why? 96 or 7 percent years ago when I cared enough to do the math, I found that almost all crop circles are sitting over an aquifer of water. Wiltshire, England has the largest salt aquifer in the world, which is an underground pool of salt water. So, ka -ching, that's that's a for sure. The other thing about crop circles consistently is they're always sitting on a ley line, which on a map is a direct line between two sacred sites. So, here we are in this area that's like splattered with sacred sites, ancient mounds, stone circles, ancient temples. I mean, there's so much there that is druid, that is thousands of years old, not 
50 or 80, but thousands of years old. But it's not just thousands of years old. These are areas where the Druid have walked across Europe to do sanctuary, to do ceremony, to honor the earth, not just the gods, the earth. So here we have really powerful earth energy. Now, not only is it ley lines and water in Avebury, but the two most powerful ley lines on the planet, the Michael and Mary lines, cross at the edge of the Avebury stone circle. And three underground streams meet in the center. Talk about a power wheel. The Avebury stone circle is these huge sarsens of granite and quartz. A sarsen is a stone. And we don't say, oh God, it took me years to stop saying rock. The Drew would look at me like, rock? Oh, you're so American. Stone, stone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, stone. It's a stone. Yeah. Stone. So I got pretty good with, you know, speaking clearly with them. But uh, so anyway, we've got these huge sarsens that are huge percentage of quartz. What is quartz? It's the stone of communication. Thus, the stone circles way under the ground, coming out of the ground, bringing in all this communication. Of course, we've got a vortex there of really enhanced frequencies. All these sacred sites everywhere, thousands of years of historic ceremony. The circle makers have these huge farm fields. What a perfect canvas. So Wiltshire has been hit more than anywhere else or documented, to be more clear, documented more than anywhere else. So who knows, like we said, there could be a Minneapolis might be a peak, but we just don't hear about it. So what's happening in crop circles to lay that wheat down and swirl it so perfectly? What they discovered was, and they did it through unbelievable repeated tests, which is what makes science science. If you can prove it repeatedly with the same results, then you've got a phenomenon. And they definitely proved it beyond a doubt that, and here's the big one, Crop circles are not coming out of the sky, and everybody wants to think it's some military satellite shooting down lasers, you know, and they got their little spirograph, <clears throat> or, you know, Doug and Dave, you know, Doug and Dave are the only ones making crop circles for like how long, 10 years? But we forgot to talk about the one that happened in France and Switzerland that night. So if Doug and Dave made them all, and he flew to France and Switzerland on the same night as he did too in Wiltshire, he's ET anyway, and so is his boy buddy. So, you know, come on, you can't win that other than the fact that the news ran with it and people still believed it. It's sad what they've done with crop circles, but it's because of the science, the plasma science. So what we proved, not we, I'm just the mouthpiece because Lefty picked me and he pushed me forward. And it's the darndest thing. I actually hear him yelling now and then I call Penny, does he swear? And she laughed only when he's mad because I heard him yelling at me because I gave the movie to Linda Moulton Howe and I really want her to write a review. And for a whole week, every day I heard him yell, tell her to watch the damn movie. And it was this angry voice. And I called Penny and I said, would he? She just laughed. She goes, oh yeah. So anyway, Lefty does uh, definitely play in the fields. And I'm grateful for it because that's how the movie happened so effortlessly. But here I am with Penny, and she's explaining that they discovered that crop circles are coming out of the earth in pairs of counter-rotating spinning plasma. Now, they look like little tornadoes energetically, but they're called vortex or vortices, because you have two, usually in pairs. And yes. there's only one main footage that most people have seen, Oliver's Castle, 1996. Two balls of light lay a crop circle down in seconds. Everybody has seen it that cares about crop circles. Yes, yes. In, in crop circle diaries, I actually proved it was real. But what really hit me strange was my very first movie. I proved it was real and I knew nothing. What happened, um, again, I'm leaving the science, but I'm talking about the magic because the magic and the science is very much like Penny and Lefty. She is yeah. telepathic and um, into all these metaphysical things where he's the science. And it does take both to create a real phenomenon. But they prove that crop circles are coming out of the earth in counter-rotating, spinning in opposite directions, plasma frequencies. And they spin and they pull in whatever was predetermined to be a part of this particular message. So if perhaps, which I know happened, there's a group of people 
that were meditating in the Avery Stone Circle with their technical crew and they said, we really need a confirmation and they're sitting in a stone circle and they're clustered together in this huge intention, please bring us a crop circle and bang, the next day, there it is in the field. I've had three of those in my movies. One of them was mine. One of them was my experience. And again, just took my breath away. Until Crop Circle Diaries, I kept saying, there's no way I can tell anybody these things that keep happening to me until I met Penny Kelly and everything made sense. And in the movie, every time I'd lay down a story that I'm just like, nobody's going to believe this, she immediately pops back, well, this is totally real. It ha it's how it happened. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, I'm not loopy. Of course not. This is totally real. You were just willing. So here's the willing strangeness was that as I'm laying out my very first movie and I didn't know about the counter rotating vortices or the plasma balls, I finished this movie in no time flat. I had hired a film crew to film me and my crappie friends my second year, 2007. I went for nine weeks and I come home with all this footage. I lay out a timeline with some kid from Craigslist and the movie 77 minutes. Oh my God, it's so easy. This is fun. So the gear is all simmering and I said, let's just close it down, go out on the deck, take a break, pour some water overhead, come back in and watch the movie like we don't know me. So we, we, we head out and I looked over my shoulder and I said, whoa, turn the monitor off, please. Said, What's that blue orb on it? There's a blue orb. And I started looking closer and the blue orb had like sacred geometry in it. And I walked closer, I was like, what the heck is that? It's not even in the movie. And it was a really gorgeous blue orb with all these dimensions in it. And the editor comes up and he goes, um, monitor's unplugged from the wall. And I looked at him and all of a sudden I went, oh, wow. And I'm in Boulder, Colorado. The hair went up on my arms and goosebumps head to toe, tingles on the top of my head. And this poor kid, 26 year old brilliant editor looks at me and he goes, you look weird. And I'm shape shifting in front of this guy <laughs> into being in the energy yeah. of being in a crop circle. I had no idea what I was doing other than, wow, I feel like I'm in a crop circle. Oh my God, I'm tingling. But I didn't say all that. I was just like, whoa, heavy. But when the kid said, you look weird, all of a sudden I went, wow, this is real. I'm not imagining this. And all of a sudden, it was my first movie. This information was really strong. It was telepathic. And I said to the kid, no break. Please light the gear back up. That blue orb was no accident. Plug the monitor back in. That's cool. And I took a photo of it. There's no cord. That blue orb just showed up. And Penny explained it that when there is another dimension that wants to communicate with you often, they will show up in a blue ball of light. Bingo. So the kid and I sit down and I said, I don't know why, but show me that Oliver's castle again where the balls of light lay the crop circle down. Why? I said, I don't know, just do it please. So he shows it to me and I said, show it to me backward, reverse it. Why? I said, I don't know, please just do it. So he reversed it and I'm watching. <clears throat> Slow it down. How slow? I don't know, 30%. Why did I say that? I mean, it just fell out of my face. And he looked at me and he goes, that's weird. So now this poor kid, I look weird and now I'm throwing out things that I don't know what I'm saying. So he reversed it, slowed it down 30% and there it was right in my face. I yelled, lock the frame. Now, I'm sorry, but I didn't know technical terms. I yelled, lock the frame. And all of a sudden I went, oh, that was weird. And right there is a binary code between the two balls of light of Oliver's castle right before they laid the crop circle down in seconds. They communicated. How yeah. did that yeah. happen? How did that happen? It was in my first movie at the very end. Nobody noticed. So I stuck it in my fourth movie three times in the first five minutes. Still, nobody's noticed. But that movie won five awards. It was really seen, but still nobody noticed that the balls of light communicated. So when I finally met Penny Kelly, I, I'm sitting in her house now. I've hauled my movie camera out for the wake because I knew I am definitely doing the story of the crazy crappy girl and the scientist's partner that nobody knows about. And so we spent three weeks rolling film. She said that through their experiments, not only was it um, earth energy, but also because it always comes through water, that it was water energy as well. But when these balls started spinning, there were different layers of distinct 
different frequencies with distinct boundary conditions. So you have electromagnetic field, you've got earth energy, you've got water energy, you've got ion electron avalanche frequencies, um, all these different varieties of different things. And if humans were meditating, their human consciousness frequencies go into these spinning plasma vortices. If, golly forbid, a race flew over and like, dang it, where's Saturn? They'll throw down a question to the Earth and they'll say, Earth, give us directions. And there are so many crop circles that are clearly planetary layouts with perhaps information, a planet missing, or something where it's actually aimed in the correct direction of the question that was just asked. So as we've got these counter-rotating vortices, they already knew what the formation is going to be. The Earth already gave them the energy. The water's working it. Now they're spinning faster and faster. And we get to the exact frequency, if they needed those ET frequencies, because it was a question the ETs asked the Earth, then those frequencies are thrown in. So it is Earth. Sometimes, always Earth, always water, sometimes humans, sometimes ET, not always, but always earth and water. So yes, all of us are totally able to be a part of crop circle communications, co-communications. And then when you look at once the message is laid out, who is it for? It's for the earth. It's for the water because those frequencies go out to all the waterways. And it's for all the people that see it or the people that fly over and film it or the other dimensionals or the animals that come in and they get their frequency shift. So it is a co-communication with all of us, potentially, for all of us, ultimately. But what happened was that William Levengood one day was cleaning his desk. And he found this old packet of seeds that were all shriveled up. And um, he looked and he was like, ah, I'm going to throw them away because they're shriveled. No proper seedsman would do anything with these seeds. So he started to put them in the trash. And that little voice came in and he went, oh, oh. And that little voice said, mm, don't, don't throw those seeds away. So he sat back and he put them in the germination chamber and he put them in the germination tank. And son of a gun, it was seeds that were lost on his desk for six to eight weeks which was the magic that helped him discover that the seeds inside crop circles, when you shrink them of light, water, air, because they were sitting in a bag for six to eight weeks, shrunken like they were dead, what they were doing was building their energetic core from that center of life, that seed, and the, the life was just fighting, and so it was building its power, and then when he stuck it in the germination chamber consistently, these seeds grew 30 to 400% more food and biofuel with up to 75% more nutrition per plant. Oh my God, oh my God, we can save the food supply. So you can take these seeds and you can actually have far more yield with far more nutritional value. Well, they said, how can we recreate this to be able to use it for humanity? I saw the machine. We have it. What do they do to Lefty? Ah, oh, the story's too long. It's in the movie because Penny Kelly laid it out, what they did to William Levengood um, to get well, his work probably, hidden. They've done with him what they've done with anybody that has come up with alternative technology that would benefit humanity and take us off of their meter system. Because this means mm. literally that we harness this energy, we harness these abilities. All of a sudden, we don't need big food anymore we don't need big pharma anymore think about big energy once you mm -hmm. begin to harvest this type of energy so i mean i don't even need to use my imagination here the stories are very old what they've done it goes from tesla the whole way forward right well what they did with lefty was he had one little niche well, he had a few little niches in his personality, but he was a scientist He really didn't like to be social. And he unfortunately had a tick in his speaking where if somebody got in his face and intimidated him, he would start to stutter. And if he stuttered and they got in his face, he could not speak. And so when he went for his PhD, there were three people on the jury. And when he went for his final presentation, they had pulled one of the guys and brought in a troll. And the troll hated William Levengood. And sure enough, the guy knew that he had this little 
problem. And so the guy got in his face because Lefty came to the final uh, PhD. I don't know what they call it, but you know, when they say, yes, here's your paper and congratulations. Yeah, dissertation, basically. Dissertation. Yeah, dissertation. Thank you. Yeah. So they had posed a question to him that they knew he couldn't possibly solve. He said he didn't eat for days, for weeks, and he solved it. So when he came back for the final dissertation, he had the answer. It made the man so angry that he got in his face and he was doing this at him. And Lefty just stuttered, and the guy got in his face more, and he wouldn't let off, and Lefty walked out. And he said, <coughs> I don't need the paper. I'm a scientist. I just want to go back to the lab. I don't need your stupid stuff. So he goes back to the lab and sure. A little while later, he gets an invitation from the National Science Academy. And they asked him in Washington to please come and do a dissertation on the origin of glass. I mean, he was brilliant. 60 years a scientist. Unbelievable numbers of uh, letters, uh, workings that he had done in um, journals in publications. He had more than anybody else in the scientific community. So this guy, um, the, the, the guy that made sure he didn't get his PhD, then started to spread rumors that, you know, he wasn't good enough and all this. But when the uh, Science Academy wrote him, he was delighted and honored, but they said at the bottom, please attach your PhD, to which he responded, I'm ever so sorry. But the National Scientific Academy said, William Levengood, it's not about necessarily the, the letters behind your name. It's also about the experience and the education that you have. We totally consider you a doctor, and we would love for you to come. So he never called himself a PhD, but a couple times he signed his name William Levengood. And do you know that still today, they are using the fact that he doesn't have the literal paper, but that he signed his name doctor, they're still using that to say, he was a liar. Why would you listen to him? He was a liar. I mean, when I see that on Facebook, I'm just like, what? Are we still in the 90s? But nobody's told the story except Penny Kelly finally came clean. So here we have his technology that was re-engineered in the lab. Penny Kelly and I are looking for funding to be able to bring this project forward. Um, I've said to her, even if they blew up the lab, could you make the machine? Absolutely. So um, we're trying to bring it. And I just started an Indiegogo funding drive, which I want to mention. Yes. You know, for me, um, none of my friends have any idea why I'm still doing this, because it has cost me everything that used to be a beautiful life. Rather than stopping, I changed my lifestyle, because I think this is too important to stop. And with the level of meddling I'm dealing with, clearly this is really an important technology. And for me, it's not about winning, it's about helping humanity move forward. So I really do hope people will support my films, come to the website cropcirclefilms.com, but also to wake up to what's going on in the community and realize that this separation isn't you and me hating people. This separation is you and me with our eyes open listening. And I'm not personally calling out David and Corey. I'm saying we've got a real problem that's controlling things and pushing forward a narrative that is so much the same people all the time and closing out everything else, which is real contact, which is real technologies, which is free energy, which is zero point. They're doing limited versions, but it's very controlled. And that's not how we move forward. We move forward by flushing the toilet, and then we have new conferences, new events that are actually free energy, advanced technologies, things yeah. that can save the planet, yeah. and Lefty and Penny's crop circle research. Bang, we win. The most important thing right now is to separate, to use the metaphor, the wheat from the chaff. Because in this field, there's a mixture, and we don't need to go in into i've said this before and people don't understand when i say this i'm not questioning the narrative that has been advanced by corey good even though i know the origin of it and it's well documented and i've put the documents out there for people to look at you saw them and people you know saw those documents those were provided to me to publish the reason for that was 
Let's put this on the record. Now, having said that, what concerns me is the cult of personality, the crass commercialism, and the advancement of what I consider to be undocumentable, not undocumented, undocumentable experiencers at the sacrifice of people who are doing hard research. And hard research, by the way, includes the psychic intuitive side of it and the experiencer side of it as well. All of those are legitimate. And the schism now is between hard researchers who have drawn a line and rightfully so, but they're excluding some very important elements that go into advancing the conversation forward. And it's what one of my experiencers said to me, we are the evidence. The living experiencers of these things, just as you went into the crop circles, you, you walked away with science and you walked away with empirical evidence, but you walked away with a psychic intuitive experience that no photograph, no tape recording, no hard copy can document. You simply have to communicate that energetically. And for me, that's the most important thing in this field. If people wanna go off and have their fantasy conferences and tell each other woo woo stories, that's fine. But I've already called that community and said, you guys need to tighten your act up. And the people who are doing research into free energy, the secret space program, ufology, they need to begin to separate themselves out and let the fantasy crowd go off to Comic Con and have bubblegum cards and trading, you know, comic books and all the things that they want to do in the fantasy world. But let's, let's make this a call to clarify what research is, what experiences, and how it can bring something to the table that's synergistically much bigger. Yes. Well, you know, that, that communication that I found between the balls of light to me is such a physical manifestation of evidence. But the interesting thing, the variety of the reactions was that, um, and it was definitely a binary code, it's white, black, black, white with two balls of light on the end of spinning plasma. Right before the field went down, bang, they communicated and down went the field. The moment I found it, I said, oh my God, those balls of light just communicated. And in my mind, I knew that what they said was, I'll do this, you do that, and the field goes down. And I was like, wow, that was amazing. This poor editor, I mean, you know, he loved it by the end, but he watched, he was my witness, and he would stand up for me in a court of love any day and say, I was there. It was true, she got weird, you know. So um, the interesting thing was, I showed it to Penny Kelly, a screenshot, an 11 by 14 of the balls of light and the plasma field, or the uh, binary code between them. I didn't tell her what it was. And I lit up the cameras when I was at her house, and I showed her the photo, and I said, what is this? And she looked right at it, and she goes, wow, what a great shot. Two plasma balls communicating in a binary code. Where'd you get that? I was like, oh, my God. And she said, I said, how did you know? And she goes, I'm looking at it. And I was like, God, that was my exact thought. And I said, what are they saying? Can you read the code? And she said, well, this ball's saying I'll do this, and this ball's saying I'll do the outer circle, and bang, the field went down. I'm like, oh, my God, how did I know that initially when I found it? Penny Kelly totally concurred. But the interesting thing was that after I had won my five awards, I was at the UFO Congress, and people kept saying to me, well, you need somebody with PhD to back up that that's a binary code. You need Mr. Big to come in there and clarify that you're correct. And I'm like, really? This is so telepathic. I mean, I was there. They used me. And that's the I was point that I was making, is we just, you, you cannot hard document everything. You know, and I, I know people like Richard Dolan know this. I know that a lot of the science guys know that there is a psychic, intuitive, empathic aspect to research when it's followed. Einstein used it, Tesla used it, all the great inventors locked into something that was outside of the rational mind in order to activate the creativity and the inspiration to make great inventions. 
Absolutely. And Penny and I both work on telepathic level. I barely touch the ground, which doesn't make me a whole lot of fun socially in Boulder, but um, you know, I can be if I want, but I really much prefer to be in the woods with the wildlife. And you know, I feel that wildlife is almost a practice for communicating with ET because you can't be aggressive. You need to present yourself and then step back slightly and give them the opportunity to show you how to communicate. The only UFO movie that really affected me was Arrival. And it was only when the woman unzipped her thing and she came out of her, her hiding case. And then the EETs were totally ready to communicate. Scary, because that's going to be me. When they show up, I'm probably going to be the one to go, I'll do it, you know? And I will absolutely unzip. If the canary's still singing, heck yeah. And the guys are all screaming, don't do it, don't do it. You know, it's like, let go and communicate from a different place, not from a place of war mind or right. threat because Hollywood trained us, but actually to step out of what they want you to look like, scary, and just be. And, and other dimensionals feel that. And that's how we're gonna move to the next, in my opinion. It's also why I've been totally fearless. I didn't study Hollywood's alien movies to know that they're all coming here to kill us and suck our blood out and all that. You know, I went and laid in a bunch of crop circles and I'm totally moved by it. But the interesting thing about the binary code between the balls of light, which to me is downright evidence. The other reason I think they're hiding crop circles is because all of the UFO phenomenon, there's only one that leaves acres and acres and acres and acres of biophysical evidence that you can't reproduce, crop circles. So we have undeniable evidence. We also, Penny mentioned, and I showed photos in the movie, Crop Circle Diaries, um, they also found that there was iron ore that had floated through the air in the middle of the night and it had molded to the leaf, top and bottom. Okay, now if, Iron ore is molded to the top and the bottom, and she peeled it away, and you could see the leaf structure in the iron ore. They tested the metal like, oh my God, it's iron ore, which has to be at 1,200 degrees to become molten, to be able exactly. to mold to the leaf. Exactly, yep. Well, 100 degrees, how did it not burn down the field? It's crop circle magic, it just didn't. So here we have this biophysical evidence that is completely undeniable. Undeniable. It's why they are hiding crop circles. It's why probably somehow our research center closed last year. Not only the research center, but the only store in the Avery Stone Circle, The Henge, used to sell a hundred of my movies if they sold one. No longer carry crop circle stuff because, and may, nobody's really asking much about crop circles anymore. I'm like, what? Who wiped you? What happened? And this year, it's like the farmers are being told, don't let people on your land, write down their license plate, especially anybody flying a drone, and report it to the police. It's, it's so unbelievable that it's this bad now. But why? Why would they hide something? Don't they like food? Don't they have a child or a family member that they actually care about that eats? This isn't about UFOs scaring people. This is about friggin' food. And what is happening is it's the earth communicating with her people and the visible things that people like me are willing to bring to the public are without a doubt biophysical evidence. The nodes where the wheat bends, you can't recreate a bubble in a stalk of wheat. So what we have is acres of physical evidence of biophysical change. A stalk of wheat, corn, barley will go up, and then every five inches there will be like an elbow called a node. Right. When the spinning balls of light send that binary code and whoop, they go down in seconds, how do they know to have 8,000 go this way and 12,000 go that way? I mean, I can't even fathom the perfection well, no, the, of all this. The geometric intricacy of these things was one of the reasons why anybody that looks at this goes, now, I'm, and I'll preface this. You've told me that you know that some crop circles are human-made. But the, inter the intric intricate level of the patterns in the best crop circles are extraordinary. The detail, the level of precision, the energetic... When you look at a real crop circle, you get an energetic communication from it. 
can humans do that? Yeah, inspired humans can do that. People whacking at crops with boards and ropes can't do that with that level of precision, much less the type of communication that comes energetically off of these. And, and when I've looked at them, I've been, that's incredible. It would take a trained artist on paper doing that to create something that's that beautiful, that intricate, that able to communicate visually on site something that powerful because they're very powerful to look at. Now from the air, you would discern that inside of a crop circle. Let's talk about this for a minute. Inside of the crop circle, there is an energetic field there. And I've seen the videos and you inside of the crop circle and people laying down is there an altered state to this? Is there, I so want to do this. I mean, seriously, I told you the story of being out in Arizona with some friends watching one of your films and these mm -hmm. four guys, and we're sitting there and we're going, we've got to get money together. We've got to go over, we've got to do this because it was just so inspiring to watch. What I saw was a, a sense of joy, a sense of almost ecstasy that came out of that. It was yeah, it was ecstasy. 2006, seven, eight. Um, in 2008, I filmed three movies without even knowing it, but I was so threatened um, uh, because, and again, I didn't realize at the time what a threat I was because I was filming everything and flying in these little planes and the crazy girl that would go into anything in the rain. You know, I mean, I was, I was always the aggressive one because I couldn't get enough and I have to go back to America so I you know I gotta capture it all. There was a day so rainy that nobody would leave the research center except me. Simple circle, three little nothings, but I put on those big wellies, those big rubber boots, slosh, 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 and I went into the field and it's pouring rain and I got my camera under a tarp because little did I know, I only read page one that said, don't get your camera wet. So I bought a tarp. So I got my movie camera under the tarp and I'm trudging in with the wellies to this field. And in the center of each simple circle was all this silver matter, silver dust. I was like, it was wet. It was a pool of shiny metallic, I don't know. And then I went back to the research center and I told the owner, what was that weird silver stuff in the middle of those simple circles out there in the rain? His eyes almost exploded and he goes, there's a spoon in the bag, any chance you'd go back? Because nobody else would in the rain. And I was like, well, how important is it? And he goes, silver, liquid, uh, really? So I went and got it and I've never heard the results, but I did go back and, you know, like I said, there were, um, when I first flew in the micro lights, I had no idea what I was doing. I get in the plane, and I look at the pilot and I was like, where's the halter? And he goes, oh, it's just the belt. And it's like a man's belt, like nothing. And the pilot looks at me with a serious face and said, door on or door off. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he goes, your side. The professional photographers never want a door on their side. And I was like, oh, how high are we going? Oh, 3000 feet. Really, are you pulling my leg or really no door? Boom, the door's off. I'm like, oh shit, excuse my language. I've got this teeny little belt, 3,000 feet, and I'm filming crop circles. Now the first pilot wasn't so great, but the second pilot, a white plane, a lot newer, but he had this funny thing, he'd always say, do you wanna do another circle? And you know, I got my movie camera, I do like three loops, and then I had to lock it under my arm, everything's tied down, and pull out my little camera and do snaps. You know, you've got stills and, and moving. Right, right. So he'd always say, do you want to do another loop? And every time I'd say yes, he'd go look at me. So I'd always look at him. <clears throat> and finally one day, I said, why do you always say that? And he goes, trust me. And I said, but why do you always make me look at you? Ah! And I looked and he banked the plane. I mean, so tight when i said do you want another loop every time i could go okay we're, we're we're bounced again i go how did you do that so fast it was because we were like this and i never looked over my shoulder again because it was the earth and again teeny little nothing belt and thank you mercury poisoning oh my god i did things i would never do tomorrow cool. but the movies are pretty darn authentic and real and again the telepathy i think is where we need to move as a species now how can we get Absolutely. our field to wake yes. up? Yes. 
Yes. How can we shift the frequency without making all the speakers angry at me? I think there's speakers angry at me. And I haven't said to them, hate those people. Don't work there. I've never said that. What I've said is, I lost four films for 10 years. I lost the life of my four movies that won five prestigious awards for 10 years. That's my experience. It's not slander. It's experience. Gaim will not let go of my films unless I sign the gag order and that whole thing we talked about earlier, which I just won't do. Which includes so, the surveillance, by the way. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I didn't realize you were so creeped out. For me, what's super creepy. creepy is the level of hacking I'm tolerating. I'm not saying it's them. I don't know who it is. But what I know is whoever it is has connections at the post office, at UPS, at Amazon Legal, at Amazon Copyright, at YouTube Legal, at YouTube Copyright, at Vimeo. Oh my God, Vimeo. Vimeo was great. I wake up one morning and I look at my $4 rentals because somebody from Canada wrote me and said, what the hey? Somebody had changed my Vimeo rental price from $4 to $651.34. pennies, $631.54 to rent my $4 rental movie, and all of them had been changed. So I was like, what the hell? And I had already gone through 150 fake ads of my movies on Amazon. Oh my God, 382 screenshots of Amazon frauds, seven countries, fake stores left and right. Oh my God, they're really paying somebody a lot, whoever it is. So Vimeo was like after 150 Amazon fraud ads. And I was like, who the heck's in charge of Vimeo? And I typed it in, sure enough, that name came up, Sam Tolls, that guy that told the department at Gaim to not talk to me, mm. to make everything go to him. He's mm. running Vimeo. I wonder if he had anything to do with not liking me, but I'm not saying he did. I don't no. know. But what I knew in that moment was, why bother? And I pulled my ads, and I haven't been on Vimeo since. I feel like I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm dealing with children that have a bad attitude. For me, I'm just too old to go, wow, I'm scared. Wow, I'm threatened. Wow, I'm losing my money. That doesn't hit me. What I look at the whole thing is, you are a bunch of stupid ass bullies acting like this. I'm a respectable person. You're treating me like crap for how many years? And it just continues. For me to look at David and Corey being so exposed for millions of dollars, Corey said, look at the promotion that that corporation can afford to do on the people it chooses to promote. But they had the money six and a half years ago to honor my films, which told the truth then. Still today, they're not promoting my films. So what is it that's so different between me and David and Corey? I'm not mad at David and Corey or saying anything about them. I'm just saying, why are the people paying them so much, making sure that my movies are hidden? What is that about? And why all the hacking? You know, what is that about? Perhaps different elements, entities, I don't know. But the level, I think the worst hacking last year in 2016, I got to deal with PBS. They're running Crop Circle Diaries. I was like, woohoo, I want to make the color even better and the sound better. So I sent it out to my editor in Seattle. And uh, he, he did this great work to it. But while he was working on it, something happened and he called me and he said, uh, <clears throat> do you have master backup hard drives? And I said, of course I do, in different places, why? And he said, well, <clears throat> something hit our lab last night and our entire mainframe is blown out. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we've, taken, we've taken the entire system apart and luckily it didn't burn out the platters and we've sent them off to Kansas, I think he said. I'm first thing in the morning. I've just finished Vimeo on Amazon. Now, somebody blew up the lab in Seattle that's editing my film. And then he said to me, not even having any idea that it could have anything to do with me. God forbid, I don't want him to think that. Whatever it was, he still doesn't get it today. Came back and hit us again and deleted five master hard drives clean out of hundreds. Two were yours. That bothered me a lot. 
he lost a lot of business. He lost tens of thousands of dollars. He had to get his gear fixed. I don't know if it had anything to do with me, but I certainly had a rough 2016 and I'm still standing. I actually care about people. I actually really believe that nobody is honoring William Levengood and Penny Kelly's work. Nobody in the field will acknowledge the communication between the balls of light. And the funniest thing was that when I was told, you gotta get somebody with a PhD behind your name like they did the lefty, um, to say that those balls of light really communicated in a binary code, they gave me the name of Mr. Big in the field. And I won't say his name because it's gonna be embarrassing, but he actually took two months to look into my binary code between the balls of light, and his response at the end was, it appears it's an eyelash that fell on the original footage. No. He really said That's that. what he said to me. Uh -huh. It's an eyelash that fell on the original footage. But don't worry, I sent it off to Peter Sorensen for a second opinion. Well, I know Peter in Europe. So I wrote Peter about a week later and I said, so what do you think? About what? I said, well, uh, Jim said he sent this to you. And he goes, he sent me nothing. So I said, oh, hmm. So anyway, as the magic goes, in December, as I'm burning Crop Circle Diaries, I'm flying because I film me and Penny. And between the two of us, that's a movie. That's Crop Circle Diaries. But sure enough, I run into one of my old Crop Circle friends, Bear Cloud, beautiful Native American, elegant man. He comes straight up to me, looks me in the eye and said, I have a gift for you. What's that? He said, I have the original Oliver's Castle footage and I'm going to give it to you. You're the one. And oh, I'm like, there, there you are, bam. Forensic great evidence what, right there. What are the chances? So he says, but you have to come to my house in Sedona. And I said, well, I'll be there in three weeks. How's that work for you? So I go to his house and he shows me his crop circle movie that he made in the 90s. And there it is. The guy that told me it was an eyelash, told me it was an eyelash, is right there with Bear Cloud in the movie. It's Jim Delatoso. And he's sitting there in front of a wall of gear. And he says right into the camera for Bear Cloud, I'm absolutely sure it's real, frame by frame by frame. This, these balls of light are absolutely real. Every bit as real as the Phoenix lights. And again, I'm watching this going, that's the guy that told me it was an eyelash and that it was all fake. So, hmm, I mean, it's been really fun from the start. But I said to Bear Cloud, I can use any footage in your movie. I'll take that one right there. And I need you to put it in writing that I can do it because um, I need you to put it in writing. He goes, oh, Patty, don't be ridiculous. Of course, you know. And I said, no, it's not about you. Somebody else might come back and not be happy that he's telling the truth exactly. in my movie. Yeah. So Bear Cloud yeah. put it in writing. And in Crop Circle Diaries, there's Jim Delatoso in front of a wall of gear, proving beyond a shadow of a doubt, frame by frame by frame, that Oliver's Castle is real. Here I am with Penny Kelly going, those balls communicated. And what they said was, yeah, I'll do this, you do that. It is so in your face. Here we've got these biophysical nodes that have exploded. And you can see that some of them actually had black burn mark where steam came out. What happened? Okay, so you've got the iron ore. You've got this tremendous heat blowing these balls and extending the nodes. And what we learned was that the um, <clears throat> spinning plasma heated everything to the exact temperature for the chemistry to all work with the, the science, the harmonics, and everything, it all happens at the same time. But the fact that they communicated, I think is the most incredible thing. And you can see it in three of my movies. It's right there in your face, but most people will say to you, it's an eyelash, go back to sleep. Colin Andrews absolutely proved that Oliver's Castle was fake with the Nippon TV team and the secret detectives. Now, God bless him, he's a nice guy and his buddy, Uncle Lawrence Rockefeller. But when Colin and I met, he looked at my face and he said, I hey, loved your movie, Crop Circle Update, The Wake Up Call. Quite nice, the wife and I watched it. Now, this was four hours before I knew who he was and that he was the guy that proved Oliver's Castle was fake. And this is proof that Patty really didn't study anybody's research. So I looked at him and I said, 
you watched the movie that just won all the awards. And I said, what did you think of the first five minutes when I proved the Oliver's Castle footage was fake? And we just stared at each other and I said, you missed it? Because I did it three times in the first five minutes. One, two, three in a row. You missed it all three times and he just stared at me blankly. Mm, and I went, yeah. hmm, I thought you knew a lot about crop circles. And then four hours later, he wins the Lifetime Achievement Award. And when they put up the five minute video of all the great things he did, there he is telling the world, Oliver's Castle is fake. I went in with the Nippon TV team and the secret detectives and we proved it absolutely it's fake. And I'm going down in my chair at the EV Awards like, oh, oh, I finally meet, you know, these people in the field. He's going to think I'm some kind of idiot because I said, so what do you think? I proved you were wrong. You know, I didn't know who he was. So after the crowd cleared and he's got his award, I walk up with my tail between my legs and he goes, you really don't know other people's research, do you? And I said, no, nope. no, nope, I don't. But I'm going to ask you a favor. Would you be kind enough to go home, watch it again with the wife, and really watch that thing that I feel is real? Would you be kind enough to get back to me and just tell me? Because you're Mr. Lifetime Achievement. I trust you. I want you to tell me what you think. And the punchline was after we went back and forth, he's so lovely and polite. I can't say that you're right, but I can't say that you're wrong either. Wow, he just bailed on his own verdict, didn't he? Man. Well, he had to, you know, protect his place, and God bless yeah. him. Um, what you got? But you know, here we whole, are. This is the whole political thing in all of this. You know, they're taking checks in the back from the big players to come out with certain information to kind of skew the conversation, which is really on a mass scale what, let's just say, the big players in the field are doing right now. It's just enough to spin things that you go, eh, I don't know. Um, gosh, that looks awful fake. But, hey, let's go down and see the blue avian guy because, well, he's interesting. And in it's entertaining. Meantime, and in the meantime, we have a world out there that needs technology, that needs the kind of things that you've been working on for so long in relationship to this technology. And I mean, I see this technology's potential as being not just food production, but healing energy, opening up the gateways for us to unplug from the black goo that we're pumping through our pipelines and into our machines and to disengage from the energetic system of dirty energy, all this dirty signal bandwidth around us and to clean things up because <clears throat> I really think the plasma energy is a key that opens up not only clean energy and clean technology, but it opens us up to begin communicating with each other in a way that doesn't require platforms and millions of dollars and lots of dirty work in the background. And you know what I mean by that, of just opening up to each other empathically and psychically. Penny really described it clearly in the movie. And what she said was that plasma is the basis of all energy. Exactly. And we don't talk about it because it is the next, it is That's the right. new. And very soon we'll be leaving oil and gas and all that behind because when we learn, and she held out two hands, when we learn to manipulate and measure plasma, we will be able to, even easier than a 3D printer, be able to recreate it. So she said, if I have a glass of water here, this yes. is a glass in the water. If I can measure the plasma field, I can recreate it here. Unfortunately, and she said it in the movie, which may be one of the lines that is such a threat to them. So what we're doing is we're spinning the plasma field in a positive manner to be able to recreate matter. The problem is if it got in the hands of the wrong people, and they spin it counterclockwise, they can destroy matter. Now, I think that that's what we're dealing with the energy weapons is that they are destroying matter and spinning the plasma field in a very negative way for humans, animals, anything they wanna hit. And I'm seeing, I'm seeing people that have been hit. I saw a woman in the last month who looked like elephant man on her face. 
and she was out in the field. She knows a lot about a lot of things. Her dog yelped. She felt like she got stung on the top of the head. And hours later, she had her face blown up, a sack of liquid under her eye. I mean, it's been a month. She's finally healing, but her eye is still bloodshot. Who did that remotely? I watched her heal. I mean, I've seen her off and on. It's like, oh my God. What's happening is people are playing with energy weapons that look like a phone. So what we need to do is really come together as intelligent people and stop doing this egophology dance where I want to be bigger than you and I want my own show and I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know what? You better want your life and your brain to stay in one place. And if you don't want your field fricked up, then you better wake the heck up and start working together with the people who are saying, I'm not here to get you to lose work. I'm trying to protect you. I'm trying to be your friend. I'm trying to be yes. a member of our community. Yeah. The biggest threat is this- right now, the dirty, dark energy is in the hands of the few. When you take the multitude of people out there who are good people, who are decent like yourself, who just want their families to prosper and their lives to prosper and for the world to please just stop the war for five minutes. When we get a hold of the clean side of this energy, it's game over for them. So it kind of answers the question, what are they trying to suppress? Why are they trying to suppress right. that? It's, it's the war <clears throat> on consciousness continued. Well, it's the war on advancing as a species yes. continued. Mm -hmm. And I think the whole hiding ufology is because we've got free energy and all the ability to do all this, we'll call it magic, but it's really just earth and ET in our frequencies. So isn't it interesting that here we are really being vague about crop circles, oh, they're all fake, but the truth is, it's the earth. Why wouldn't she be speaking to her people? And when you look at the messages, my God, at the turn of the century, Right after 9-11 was the alien face in the disc. Do you remember that one? That, the binary oh, do I remember in the... it? Oh, yes, I remember it. I had it printed out and blown up on my wall for about a year. Yes, that was a warning. Well, the words correlated, in my opinion, to 9-11. Beware the bearers of false gifts and their broken promises. Exactly. Much pain, but still time. Believe there is good out there. We oppose deception, conduit closing. Yes. Do you know the messages that the mother sent up before the BP oil spill? 2009, we had a summer of no sacred geometry, no mathematics, hardly at all. It was all pictograms of birds, fish, bugs. And they were incredible. Do you remember the dragonfly with the veins and the wings? Yes, I do. We were also going through those... We were also going through that massive die-off of birds, where birds would just drop out of the sky. Fish were dying. The birds were dying. We have that. We have the BP oil spill. That was a cry from the soul of the earth to us, in my opinion. I always yeah. that remarkable. Yeah, and the whole thing. summer. Yeah. The whole summer was birds, fish, bugs. A 1,500-foot-long octopus. Yes. I mean, outrageous crop circles, a hummingbird, the rising phoenix with the flames around her tail. Yeah. I mean, the, the earth is yelling, please stop fracking, please stop sucking my blood. And the water is coming with all this together. And those of us that are conscious are working with the circle makers. But even some human-made crop circles, and this is one of the last stories because I know our time is just, woo! Um, but it's hard to stop because there's so much incredible truth and magic when we start talking crop circles. Yeah. There was a, a crop circle that I took Sasha Stone in. Now, I was excited to take him in his first crop circle. He's from England. He's English, but he'd never been in a crop circle. We drive three hours north. The photo was incredible of this really outrageous, interesting schematic crop circle. We had no idea what it was. And I've got a film crew, I've got a drone, i got a camera guy. We've got 11 cases of gear. It was amazing. So we are um, walking into this crop circle, and the camera's set up, and Sasha and I were, you know, and, and all of a sudden I'm feeling, oh, my God, there's no buzz. 
There's no tingle. This is a human made mob circle. Oh crap, I've got the drone up. Keep a smile on your face. So we get to the back. And there's just five women sitting, you know, in the main circle on the way back. And I said, do you mind if we do a little filming? And they said, sure, sure. Do you mind if we watch? No, thank you. We'll share the space. So I light up the cameras and Sasha and I are standing there. And I said, well, what do you think of this crowd circle? And this is first one ever. And he said, I don't know much about it, but I don't really feel anything. But it sure is beautiful. And you know, he's really elaborate with his words. So he was magnificent speaking. But basically, mm -hmm. I don't think it feels very real. So I said, I've got to be honest, I don't have a buzz or tingles, but I am looking at a sacred site up there, and there's a monument over there. So we are on a ley line, and we are sitting over an aquifer, so the elements are correct. It could be real, but yeah, I kind of think it's a human-made crop circle, too. So yeah, that was our thing. And so we shut down the camera, and I looked at the women, and I said, do you have anything to say about this crop circle? And the lady leans forward and crosses her arms with a long braid, and she goes, yeah, I do. This is our crop circle. And I was like, whoa, whoa, do you mind if I turn the camera on? So she said, no, I'd be happy. So we light up the camera, and there's five women sitting there, and the center lady with the braids, like really intense, looks into the camera, and she goes, this is our crop circle. And you can say what you want about humans making it, but we are the quantum energy generator team, free energy. And I was like, oh my God, I've been reading about you guys. You're the QEG? She said, well, we're half the team. But the other half was sitting with us yesterday in the Avery Stone Circle praying for a crop circle, praying for a confirmation that we were on track. Here's a photo of our schematic, and she holds up a photo. Here's a photo that I'd seen when I was down in Avebury that made us drive three hours north. Side by side, here's the formation, here's the schematic, and she turns them, and dang, that cross circle was a schematic made by humans of their free energy device that they had prayed for the day before. Punchline. Oh my God, I'm like, how can I keep learning? I thought I knew. No, humans make real cross circles too. Oh my God. So here I am going, well, I made my movies without knowing anything. They use me. Of course they're gonna use humans that are talented, like you said earlier, great artisans that can sketch out a pattern, lay it down. So even human-made crop circles, some of them are real. How about that? That threw me, that one threw me. But my favorite story in Crop Circle Diaries was my manifestation of a crop circle. A friend comes up to the house and she shows me this artist at 10.30 at night in Boulder, Colorado. And she shows me this artist, Ariel Ali, and these photos started to make me shake. And I started crying and she said, what's going on? And I said, I don't know who this artist is or what this place is, but this is where they took me. I'm sure of it. And I'm looking, I'm getting chills right now remembering that moment of seeing the Crystal Castle, which is all my, the two times when I know I was taken, I was regressed by Mary Rodwell. I did remember absolutely where I was taken and I remembered exactly what it looked like. Now I'm looking at a photo of a crystal castle underwater and all the colors were correct and I'm just like, oh my God, I can't wait till morning. I wanna call this guy and see where's his place. If he's been there, I need to know because this is definitely where they took me. And I'm all wound up. So I get up in the morning, I get the coffee going and I open up my computer and sure enough, there's a brand new crop circle in England. And, um, and I, I, you know, popped it up to see what it was. And there it was. It was a crystal castle crop circle with five pillars and a star on top. And at the bottom, there were five droplets of water, a shape of a teardrop, not a circle. And I'm looking at this formation, and I'm starting to shake again and cry. And down comes my friend from the guest room. And she's like, are you still upset by that artist? We should call him. And I said, no. Look at the new crop circle. And she goes, oh my God, it's a crystal castle. And I said, what time did I remember where they took me? It was 10.30 last night, which is 3.30 in the morning in England. And there's only three hours of darkness, basically, when they can make crop circles. You don't lay it down in a second. But it's only dark for a few hours. That was prime time. And when I remembered where they took me, I felt like, oh my God, they're totally acknowledging there's a crystal castle with drops of water. And there wasn't one circle. It was 
squares and a star and teardrops. There wasn't one circle anywhere. And I'd gone through, by the time my friend got up, I was like, I, there's 65 crop circles so far this summer. Every single one has a crop circle, except this one. It's an exception. Oh my God, I got a love letter from the circle makers. I can't tell anyone they're going to think I'm out of my mind, but I think this was the message. Oh my God, I'm totally into this. And so I, I um, the very next day, the circle makers came back and put I kid you not, a huge circle on top of the crystal castle with a goddess inside it. I show the photos and the story in Crop Circle Diaries on my website, cropcirclefilms.com. To me, I am so cemented that there's nothing you can do to push me over and say they're fake because I have too much physical evidence, conscious evidence, psychic evidence that I'm not budgeable. But there's a lot of famous people that'll tell you none of it's real, all of it's fake, and you should go back to sleep. Um, but if you really want what's happening in crop circles, it is amazing, and we do have the ability. You said something very, very um, advanced and tricky because you're also very intuitive and probably telepathic. Not only did Lefty and Penny create a replasma machine to bring the seeds back, but he also created a machine to save the human body's health. And um, it's a three-part machine, and I saw it. And um, what he did was, you hold the rods, it measures your plasma field. The next machine is a graph. The graphs, and if you're going, you're healthy, and then it drops down, and then it drops down. He'll look at you after, and he'll go, you have a pain back here? Yeah. You had an old one in your knee? Yeah. He reads you like a book. And then you go to the third machine, and it does something, and you go back, and you are healed. What it does was it repairs your blast plasma field. And so they mastered it. They totally mastered it. And I saw all the machines. I know we can bring it, but what needs to happen is that the right people need to be funded. The right technologies need to be funded. And <clears throat> number one, I am not related to Stephen Greer. Not, not, not related to Stephen Greer. Because if I were this project would be funded, my movies would have been huge by now, and nobody would be messing with me. Um, but I'm not, I'm just Patty Greer, who tells the truth in times of universal deceit, but I am hanging in like the warrior priestess that I am, and I am determined to bring these technologies. And I really hope that some of your listeners will go to my funding drive on Indiegogo, Patty Greer, whatever on Indiegogo, you'll find the 2017 and help us bring these technologies and help me get these movies out because there's no distribution. There's no distribution in America, forget about it. And YouTube, oh, I'm sorry, I need to stop. No, don't, even my go, no, don't even go there. Let's, let's leave this on the high note. We want people to go to yes. Indiegogo. We want energetically to bring this technology forward. You know, in this conversation, there are people who have jobs, there are people who have careers, and there are people who have callings. And I think over the last two plus hours that you and I have talked, you've shared your calling and the calling for a lot of other people out there to bring this thing together. Stop the petty competitions and ego games that have gone on in ufology. Let's pull this thing together. Let's do the research. Let's get this stuff funded. And let's start healing the earth and humanity. Patty Greer, it has been a delight talking to you. I, you're a friend. I count you as a friend. And I count you as somebody who's on a mission. And thanks for sharing everything with us on this show. Anything else we didn't touch before we back out of here? I think we pretty much nailed the entire house down. And you know, it. now it's just about it. watching the house of cards fall. You know, What we need to do is just build a new house. That's exactly right. We'll build the ice castle. There we go. And that's going to wrap it up for this time. There we go. With my, with my lovely guest, Patty Greer. And all of the website information is right down there on the bottom of the screen. And it's in the little description box under the video and on the webpage at offplanetradio.com. I'm Randy Moggins for Off Planet Radio. The truth is out there. It's inside you. Go find it.